All right. A little light today. Is it raining? I don't think so. Hold on. It wasn't thundering. I don't know. I'm pulled up in that, in that basement. Either. All right. What's that? I said I was, you were pulled up in the basement. I'm like, most, most biology people, yeah. Yeah. I thought I heard, I, I may have heard like thunder and stuff. No. Then, then I, I realized, no, it's probably the air handlers turning on. It's loud. All right. So we're on the trypanosomes. All right, and we kind of quickly introduced the forms of the trypanosomes. Two of them we don't need to know because we don't have them on any of our slides. Uh, but we are we do have four in life cycles. So trypanosomes, epimastigotes, promastigotes, and amastigotes. And and a big part of this is where is that kinetosome relative to our nucleus? Kinetosomes posterior to the nucleus, kinetosomes anterior to the nucleus for the epimastigotes. Do this. Uh, our kinetosomes anterior in the promastigote, but with the promastigotes, we don't have an undulating membrane because the kinetosome and the flagellar pocket is at the anterior end, and then our amastigote uh, kinetosome is antinuclear. We have the flagellar pocket, but we don't have the flagella extending out. All right. So with that introduction, let us start with the genus Trypanosoma. So this is a parasitic genus where almost all of them are heteroxynous. All right. So multi-host life cycle. Usually it involves a vertebrate host and some blood feeding insect host. There is there are some fish trypanosomes, I should say, uh, amphibian trypanosomes uh, that are probably spread through leeches as well. So blood feeding insect or leeches, depending on what species we have. Right. In the vertebrate host, it's gonna be, we're going to find it in the blood in the tissue fluid. In the inverts, we're going to find it in the digestive fluid. So basically digestive tracts and then in the mouth parts, salivary glands. Now, in this group, the trypanosomes, once we get inside the vertebrate host, you can have massive population sizes developing because these things are going to replicate inside the definitive host. Just as an example for uh, some of the African trypanosomes, 100 hours after you get infected, you can have as many as 4 billion parasites circulating in your blood and tissue fluid. That's a huge number. And, and I'm saying we're probably starting with maybe 10 20. All right, we're not starting with a huge number, all right, but the exponential replication and the speed at which they replicate could produce a massive size, which means that this population can have pretty significant effects on our host. All right, host immune system is going to be fighting it. This group causes uh, pretty significant econ economic impacts. All right, impacts not only uh, human health and loss productivity, but also, in some cases, farmland. All right, so there's trypanosome, uh, trypanosome areas that are off limits to raising cattle because they have this species, Trypanosoma brucei brucei. If that's there, you can't raise it because it causes a wasting disease in the cattle. Um, in Africa, it's called Nagana. Right? And you have an image of, of a cow suffering from that. You can see if with wasting the disease, you're not developing this cow, or you're not raising this cow for a whole lot of meat. Parasite kind of saps it away, or at least the pathology saps it away. You know, how much area is affected? Risk area for trypanosomes larger than, than that of the U.S., land area of the U.S., so pretty significant risk, risk area. Ready? So our trypanosomes, we're going to kind of split into African and American trypanosomes. All 
if a cow does have it, um, can it, uh, and you like remove that cow and pull it back with it, could you get this parasite? No, you can't get Brucia Brucia subspecies. But there is Trypanosome the Brucia gambiense and Rhodesiense that we could get. So if a cow does get it, there's no like massive anything that can kill it? Nope. Causes this wasting disease. Um, hard to raise food animals in these areas. Ready? All right, so we split it between African and American trips based on the route of transmission, right? because they do exhibit different pathways. Right? Now, this route of transmission that we talk about is related to where our parasites becoming infective. So it's where it's developing inside that in insect host and where it ultimately becomes infective. So if it becomes infective near the mouth, mouth parts, it's probably being transmitted with the bite. So for that type of transmission, it's called salivarian transmission, also called anterior station development. All right. The other side is stercorarian transmission or posterior station development. So I have a diagram of an insect insect gut to kind of show you that we have this foregut, we have a midgut, and then we have a hindgut section. And you'll learn a little bit about insect gut morphology right, in this, this unit. Right? But for our salivary and transmission, we're going to have our replication in the mid and the hindgut. We're going to have rep replication of our parasite increasing numbers, but they don't become infective to the vertebrate host until they move up to and up into that foregut, all right? So they're gonna become effect infective up in that, that anterior station, the anterior portion of, of the gut. And then if you're gonna be there up in the anterior portion, then it makes sense that you're going to be transmitted when that insect feeds on the host. So you're either gonna be injected with the saliva, uh, they're going to come out onto the skin and then find their way into the wound of the host or in one of our parasites, the insect is going to bite and then regurgitate contents of its esophagus and contents of the foregut. All right, so that's salivarian transmission. Salivarian transmission is exhibited by our African trypanosomes. Ready for the next one? So the next one is going to explain the stercorarian transmission. Next slide. We'll hide some information and reveal some other information. All right, we good? All right, stercorarian transmission is posterior station development. So we're going to have replication in uh, typically the hindgut. Could be, it could extend into the midgut. But then we're going to have movement to the hindgut and then transition to the infective stage. All right, so we have... We have development to infectivity in the posterior portion of our digestive system. So in our hindgut, we include the rectum in that as well. Right. So if we're going to be, if our the infective stages are going to be in this portion, right, then when the insect bites, it's not going to deliver the parasite to the wound. It's not, it's not in the salivary gland, it's not in, in its esophagus. Instead, with our American trips, are the insects going to bite? And as its gut fills with food, it's going to cause it to defecate, which drops now our infective stages onto the host, where it could then the infective stages can find the wound and get into the wound. All right. So transmission for stercorarian or posterior station development is fecal contamination of that bite wound which I'll refer to as bite and crap. 
Insect bites and craps as it does it. And, yet, and I think I have a picture that, that shows you why. All right? But you can also get it through accidental ingestion of the vector. So it's not the, not the only way to get it. So if you're sleeping and the insect crawls in your mouth and then you accidentally chomp on it, and, right, kind of bad to think about it, but yeah, that can happen. I bet at least once in your life you ate an insect at some point. All right? Uh, so you can get it that way. Or accidental ingestion, ingestion of the vector species. So, you know, it, it bites you. You know, maybe you, you smash it, so it smear it into the wound. Or, you know, it gets away before, before it, uh, you smash it. Then you scratch it. You get under your fingernails. Then you bite your fingernails. You, you accidentally ingested it. Now, for, for these ingestions, as we'll learn, uh, they don't go into the gut. They actually penetrate through the mucous membrane. Now, as a parting shot, before we move on, these terms, salivarian transmission and stercorarian transmission, only apply to trypanosoma species. Only apply to the parasite you know, of the genus trypanosoma, at least for this class. All right, everything else is different. So the American trips are salivarian. I'm sorry, the African trips are salivarian. The American trips are stercorarian. All right, so we're going to start with the African trypanosomes. Numerous species, but really only two species infect humans. And of these two species, you can't distinguish them morphologically. I believe we have both species on slides in the lab, and you can put them up. You can't tell them apart. All right, but if I gave you information and said, yeah, this was from... East Africa, or this was from West Africa, that tells you what species you likely have. So two species are Trypanosoma brucei gambiense and Trypanosoma brucei rhodesiense. Brucei gambiense is found in West and West Central Africa. West and West Central Africa. All right, and it tracks its vector host, the tsetse fly. All right, so the tsetse fly uh, different species of those, right? it's going to prefer, or it's going to go into these flies that prefer more of the drier type of habitats. Trypanosoma brucei rhodesiense is found in Central and East Africa. More like riverine conditions, more like water type conditions. All right. So again, kind of track to the host that it utilizes, or the vector that it utilizes. The other difference between these two is the type of infection that we get. So Trypanosoma brucei gambiense forms a chronic type of infection. If you've heard of African sleeping sickness, this is it. It can last for months. Bring on the pathology for months. All right. Trypanosoma brucei rhodesiense is, is more of an acute type of infection. It doesn't last long because death usually happens before you enter the chronic stage. How quickly? Usually within a month. Whereas our chronic stage is typically it takes a month before we get to that point. <clears throat> so we're going to be talking about these two species. And as I mentioned before, there is one species that is very important for the cattle industry. It's Trypanosoma brucei brucei. This is a causative agent of Nagana. So it doesn't go into humans, it goes into cattle. Do we have uh, treatment for it in people with it? What's that? Uh, do we have treatment for people with it? We do have some treatments, and I believe I have that on the slide. I believe I do have that on one of the slides. All right, ready? All right, life cycle. Nice thing about these, about Trypanosoma brucei, uh, is that the life cycle is similar for all, all three of these species, for brucei, brucei, for game ANC, and for road CNC. So what we're going to do is just do the generic Trypanosoma brucei, and then you know 
the life cycle of all of the waste. The life cycle is not too bad for this one. Just Trypanosoma brucei. All right, so we're going to divide it ultimately down the middle where our mammal is going to become infected. All right, so our mammal host. And it's going to be found in the blood, lymph, and tissue fluid. This is where we're going to find it. Make sure I've got my... Move it up a little bit. That's where we're going to find. All right, so our insect that's infected bites our host and delivers a trip of mastigo. All right, our trip of mastigo is a slender form. It's a slender form trip of mastigo. In this slender form, it replicates via binary fission to produce many more. It replicates rather quickly. That's our slender form. And then, as we'll see, population size increases so much that there seems to be some sort of trigger that allows some of these trypomastigotes and the slender forms start changing their shape. So they remain trypomastigotes, but they transition to an intermediate form, and then they complete their transformation into a stumpy form. A stumpy form. This stumpy form is the form that is infective to our insect vector. So you're going to have trypomastigos, they're replicating, replicating, replicating. All of a sudden, we hit population size, a large population size, probably programmed or something like that, where you've got a certain probability of transitioning, but you don't ever see that transition happen until you get a large population size. So say, you know, if, if it's a 1% chance of drawing a number, one, one out of 100, right? You can draw 100, 100 times and expect to see one, all right? But if our probability of picking our number is, let's say, 0.1, you have to draw 1,000 times to have one, you know, to see one of those. And, and that's just kind of kind of that, that story. So probably a small possibility, but we only see it. We only see these form as we're reaching the peak of our parasitemia, peak numbers inside our host. So we transition to the stumpy form. Some of it, some of the parasites transition to the stumpy form. They are now infective. So this is when our insect host, our insect host, which is a tsetse fly, will come along, feed on our host, pick up some of these stumpy form trypomastigotes where they then become procyclic trypomastigotes. Procyclic trypomastigotes. These are found in the midgut. These are found in the midgut. These trypanomastigotes are called procyclic. Why? It's our dividing form. So the procyclic trypanomastigotes are going to be replicating all right, by binary fission. And they replicate for about 10 days. For about 10 days of replicating in the mid -gut. Then some of them will migrate 
and transform into epimastigons. We have to put lumen. Uh, we'll, we'll add where they're at. They're in the salivary gland is, is, is where they are. All right? But they transition to an epimastigo while they're in the lumen, and then these epimastigotes attach to the lining of the salivary gland using their flagella. So they're attached to the villi of the salivary gland. Here, once they're attached, now they will become, or they will then transform And detach. So they'll transform into our metacyclic trypomastigo. Which is now detached. So in the lumen of the salivary gland. So if here to here, this is our salivary gland. So we have metacyclic trypomastigos. Those are the infective stages. So when our TT fly then bites the mammal, it can then inject these metacyclic forms into our host and infect them. Now, one thing I should say is that in our epimastigotes, when they get to the lumen, they can still replicate. And they can replicate for a few generations before they attach the villi of the salivary gland and undergo their transformation. How long does all this take? In experimental studies, when our TC fly takes this blood meal and becomes infected, you start seeing the metacyclic trypomastigotes in about three to four weeks. three to four weeks post-infection is when you tend to see it. Warmer periods, it'll take shorter amount of time. Cooler periods take longer amount of time. Questions? All right, so we introduced some additional terms here in our life cycle. So metacyclic and procyclic. So these are terms that we will see again. Metacyclic is just basically our infective stage. It's going to be non-dividing form. Our procyclic is going to be the div dividing stage. So typically our metacyclic is infective to the vertebrate host. Our procyclic would be the dividing form uh, in our invertebrate host. Also of note, pleomorphy occurs here. And it occurs in that definitive host. So what we have is that slender form that's replicating, and then we have transition to a stumpy form, and that stumpy form is what's infective to our insect host. Now, why is this ch change? What's going on to produce this form? Well, it's really two things. One, the flagellum is decreasing in length. All right, so the long slender form has a really long flagellum, and you can see it on our slides. All right. The stumpy form, it's going to be a much shorter flagella. The second thing is that our mitochondrion is increasing in size. So these things, as, as you'll see, you know, the reason for this transition, right, it's the parasites getting ready for life inside that insect vector. So it's mitochondria is going to increase in size and complexity to do that. So that kind of, as it increases in size and complexity, it's going to give the appearance of this stumpy form. And then, as we said, it takes about three to four weeks for our host to become infective. So these are TC flies, or at least this is an image of a TC fly here. All right, a couple different genera uh, can serve as hosts, and that was that's what was on our map. It was showing more uh, morsitans, uh, pelipides, pelipides. Have palace and, and so forth. All right, any questions?
All right, so stumpy form only appears at the peak of parasitemia. So at the peak where we have the highest number of our trypanosomiasis circulating in the blood. All right. That transition seems to be triggered by increasing density in the body. At least it's correlated, right? Now the transition, as I said, is all about preparing for life in the insect gut. And you can say, well, what, what's so different about it? Well, let's take a step back and say, let's look at our slender form, let's look, and then let's look at our stumpy form. So to better understand this, let's think about the biochemical pathways, the metabolic pathways that's taking place in our trypanosome. This slender form is a very rapidly dividing form that occurs in the blood. Because it's dividing, it has very high energy requirements. <coughs> it's replicating. And all of the cell processes that, that, that's involved, it requires energy. So it's an active energy consumer. Now you would think that oxidative phosphorylation would be extremely useful. Utilize the oxygen that's in the blood, you know, produce a whole lot of ATP to be very, very uh, efficient in it. And I'd say, yeah, and, and a lot of times we would go that way. But in our slender form, it is a very simple mitochondria and a single mitochondria. So very few cristae at all. And, and, and as you recall, maybe some of you recall, that electron transport chain happens on the membrane or in the membrane of the mitochondria. That's why we have those, those cristae to increase where those uh, membrane proteins, those me membrane transfer proteins are. All right, so they don't have this. Then you say, well, what's going on? Where does it get its energy? Well, incidentally, you're also in, a, in an environment that has a whole lot of glucose. And for a parasite, if it can get by with glycolysis only, then that's going to be preferred. Why maintain a large complex mitochondria? Why maintain all of the, all of the proteins and enzymes needed for electron transfer? Why, why employ all of those if you can get by with glycolysis? And that's the rationale. It can get by with glycolysis only. It produces just sufficient, you know, sufficient ATP so that it can rapidly divide. But once we transition into the insect gut, we lose that high glucose area. So now we start needing to be a little bit more efficient in our energy usage and energy production. So to prepare for that, now we're starting to see increase in the complexity of the mitochondria, increase in the size of the mitochondria, so that once we get into our host, our insect vector, we can start utilizing oxidative phosphorylation. Let me know when you get this. Ready? So our intermediate through stumpy forms, these are non-dividing, they don't require as much energy. And what's happening is you're getting this enlargement uh, and increase in complexity of the mitochondria. It's becoming more elaborate. Now, as it starts to increase in size and complexity, it's going to start to apply pressure, movement pressure, to that kinetosome. And when, we, when it's fully developed, right, when it's fully developed and we're fully functioning mitochondria, it's going to be, put, it, it would have pushed that kinetosome so far forward that it now flips position with the nucleus which is our transition to the epimastigote stage. It's all about, you know, that limited oxygen or oxygen and glucose. It's really what it's all about. It's really what's, what the transition is all about. And that's why the transition happens. And if it didn't need to do this, why it just stay as a trypanosome?
All right. So what causes that transition? Enlargement of the mitochondria pushes the kinetosome forward, pushes it anterior to the nucleus. It's really what's causing it. <coughs> All right, ready? Yep. All right, pathology. Pathology is caused by the immune response, and it's primarily against the slender trypanosomes. So these things are entirely extracellular. They're in the blood, lymph, tissue fluid. Right? So what are the symptoms that, that we exhibit with the African trypanosome? Well, first off, you typically develop a canker or a sore at the site of infection. Right? So you've got the saliva that, that gets injected, along with our metacyclic trypanosomes, those are gonna be the slender forms, all right? Uh, and they're gonna start dividing and you're gonna have the immune response calling in uh, inflammatory cells. Right? Inflammatory response leading to a sore or canker. Uh, this is not it, that's not our sore or canker. This is gonna last for about one to two weeks. They're going to stay, they're going to replicate, and you're just going to have this sore canker until it, and it, it'll heal. Then what you're going to get is <coughs> amplification of the parasite itself, and you're going to have the immune response taking these things out. All right? So as with most things, when our body starts to ramp up its immune system, what we end up getting is swelling, congestion of the lymph nodes. African trypanosomes cause that. And the prominent place is in the neck. And this has a name, it's called winter bottom sign. Swelling and congestion of the lymph nodes in the neck, groin, and legs. It's named for a British naval officer who learned that individuals that exhibit this type of swelling have this disease and probably aren't going to survive. Now, it's a kind of uh, sad story to think about it, but it's history. This British naval officer, what, what, what was he doing? Transporting slaves is what they were doing. And it was one of these things, when he found associated, he knew that individuals that had this swelling, they weren't going to make it, they weren't going to fetch the process, so what do they do? Toss them right off the ship. So it's been called winter bottom sun for that reason. Now, this is associated with inflammatory responses. So associated with this type of, of, of infection is intermittent fevers. And it's intermittent fevers because our, parent, our body will wipe out the trypanosomes. It'll clear it out. All right. And when you have these intermittent fevers, you're going to have generalized pain, you know, associated with it, headaches, weakness, cramps. You know, just think when you get a cold, right? How do you feel those first couple days before before you start feeling better? That's kind of the, the African trips, and probably going to be a lot more severe though. Death is possible with the African trypanosomes. And probably even more so with Trypanosoma brucei uh, rhodesiense because this also tends to generate very rapid weight loss and starts to get the heart involved to where you, you probably will die within about a month without any treatment. Ready? All right, so where does this African sleeping sickness come into play? So these are all like early on, say within a month or so. And then what could happen is that the parasite can invade the nervous system. And when it invades the central nervous system, you'll start to produce different type of symptoms. Main symptom being extreme fatigue. Right? This is where African sleeping sickness got its name. This is what we would call the chronic form because you've had it long enough to where our trypanosomes have now invaded the central nervous system producing these types of symptoms. 
Now, it is a progression, a progressive form of fatigue. So, you, you know, early on, you'll just start seeing increased apathy. You'll have uh, increased uh, motivation to work. Uh, you'll start to exhibit some mental dullness, just like, oh, man, you know, I'm tired. I'm just not all there. I'm not thinking correctly. You can start getting some uh, re reduction in coordination. A again, just kind of all tied to this just overall fatigue and, and increased sleepiness is what, is what, I, what I say here. And then you're going to have, or you can have, start to exhibit tremors. The tremors of the tongue, tremors of the hands, and tremors of the tongue, uh, uh, of the trunk, you know, your, your, your upper body. All right? You can start exhibiting those along with then paralysis and convulsions. Again, parasites in the central nervous system. Ultimately then, you can develop, you can go into a coma, and then you can die. Now, this African sleeping sickness and the progression is actually fairly rare in Trypanosoma brucei rib rhodesiense. So this is gambiense. Rhodesiense, it's gonna, typically going to cause rapid death. So oftentimes, you'll go into like a coma and then you'll die pretty quickly with, with rhodesiense. Once you get to this stage where it's in the central nervous system, uh, prognosis is pretty poor. Prognosis is poor. Yes, there are some drugs. A lot of those drugs are, are arsenic-based. Right? That, yeah, could be successful. However, you also have to survive the side effects of that arsenic-based drug. So side effects are, are, are pretty nasty. Do you know what the side effects typically are with those types of drugs? Death. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I believe like delusions respiratory impairment, pretty significant. Early on, within that first month, before it goes into this chronic stage, uh, outcomes, outlook uh, for treatments are, are actually decent. But they break it down in like stage, stage two treatment options, stage one treatment options. The later it is, the harder it is to treat. If you treat it, or if you catch it and treat it early enough, um, are there any last minute events? Uh, you need to follow it to make sure that you have cleared the infection. So there have been cases where relapse has happened. So I can let you look look up some of those. And oftentimes, they, I think current current options is to treat with two different drugs. But yeah. Arsenic is kind of preferably a last resort. Ready? Immune evasion. How does it do it? We talked about these intermittent fevers. This is where the inter intermittent fevers is coming in. Because our body will recognize and clear out these trypanosomes. But the parasites have evolved a rather interesting method to evade the host immune system. Right, they're under constant threat. They're in the blood. They're in the limb. They're, they're under constant threat. The full force is what I say here, the full force of the host immune system. So what they've evolved the ability to do is change their surface coat. And by changing their surface coat, you then present a completely different epitope to the host immune system. The host immune system has to then relearn that epitope and build up its own B and T cells again before it could clear out the parasite. So what is this, this surface coat? Well, it's called the variant antigen types, the VATs. That is the type of surface coat that, it, that is being produced. And there's been, I think, uh, over 100 different types that have been, that, that have been uh, described, or at least identified. Right. Although you, you don't ever see all of them, you, you rarely see more than a, a handful in any one individual. All right. These VATs, the variant antigen types, are determined by the variant-specific surface glycoproteins, which are the VSGs. So the VSGs, whatever VSG is being expressed on the surface, that's going to ultimately be uh, the VAT type. Now, the VSG is actually a quantitative trait. 
And I don't, maybe you've covered this in genetics. Um, I'm not sure if you do or not, but a quantitative trait is a trait that is encoded for by hundreds to thousands of genes. All right, it's not like, well, you've got your dominant allele, so you must be tall, or you have your recessive allele, and you must be short. No, that's not what it is. Height, for us, is a quantitative trait. Many, many different, different loci control that gene. How I, how I discuss it uh, with, the, with the graduate students is, think of it as light switches, a series of light switches with different combinations, right? Different, different combinations of the genes being on or off. Whatever combination, whatever sequence it is, ultimately determines your trait. So the VSG is a quantitative trait, and over a thousand genes code for it. Now, these are located in the telomeres. Why is that important? Why did I put that there? What happens at the T Those are the ends of the chromosomes, right? Those are the ends of the chromosomes. So you have a lot exactly. Of crossing over. What's that? A lot of crossing over. So you can't have a lot of crossing mm -hmm. over. What else? They degrade over time. Ooh, they do degrade over time. So that way, like, wouldn't it be like just like then at the end it can't do anymore? You'd think, right? So they degrade over time. So eventually they they kind of they don't have any telomeres. Not so with these guys. And these guys are serving as a anti-aging studies because the telomere, they can extend their telomeres. So you've got these different, different mechanisms, but telomeres, you have increased chances of crossing over. You have increased chances, replication, du duplications, transpositions, and all that stuff that's happening to increase the amount of variation that can exist in these quantitative traits. So does that kind of help mitigate the... Um, kind of the disadvantages of binary fission. That sounds like it seems like it well, allows for crossing over. Yeah, that's. I mean, you're getting you're getting a lot of you're getting you can produce a lot of variation. Yes, variation in these VSGs that would allow it to escape the host immune system. All right. So yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of cool information out here as to how it generates all this variation. Now again. They've only quantified or they've only identified over 100 VATs. And we know based on how many genes are involved, it should be a whole lot more. So there's probably some sort of, of cost. Uh, or maybe some of these VATs just aren't very good at protecting the parasite. All right. So in these VATs, only one VSG is ever expressed at a time on an individual. So each individual trypanosome is only expressing one VSG. It originates from the uh, flagellar pocket and then it spreads around our parasite. Each individual is only expressing one, but then in our population, it's going to be dominated by a single VAT. That dominant VAT type is going to be the one that the host immune system targets, learns about and then takes out and wipes out. But it's only attacking that one VAT. You also have some of these really small populations of the other VAT types. All right, so when that other VAT type, so once this, once the human body is wiping that out, it's allowing a second type now to replicate and take over. Now it's increasing. Now the body has to recognize, learn, and then fight this one. And when that goes out, now you're allowing a third VAT type to take over. At each of these peaks, we're at our peak inflammatory response, hence our intermittent fevers that, that, that are being exhibited by our African trypanosomes. All right? So as we've kind of started alluding to, the VATs, or the VSGs, are conferring protection through this periodic antigenic variation. It's periodically changing, and it's not necessarily the parasite is changing its VAT. Uh, it's VSG. It's just that we have such a large number that we have all of these subpopulations of alternative VSGs or alternative VATs that are then allowed to increase in numbers when the body attacks the primary one that, that, that's at the highest population. All right, so the periodic antigenic variation allows our species, the overall, you can say our superpopulation maybe, uh, to survive. 
The second thing that, that these things do, or the second way in which they provide uh, protection is that they shield the non-variant epitopes, or the conserved epitopes. So these aren't the only surface proteins or surface glycoproteins. You've got other ones that are on there. I mean, our parasites has to absorb nutrients, has to transport nutrients uh, across the membrane. Those things are conserved. If the body recognizes those in response to those, then it would be very effective to clear out the entire superpopulation. So the VSGs are going to be large. They're going to be protecting those. So when the body responds, they're only going to go against the VSGs. Question? VATs. All right. Next up is our American trypanosome. They're different. That's all I can say. All right? They're different. They're different in their life cycle. Different in they don't have the VSGs and VATs. They cause different pathology. So uh, <coughs> I guess we could start on it. Right, we've got a couple minutes. No one's asking questions online. So, with our American trips, I've also grouped in leishmania. And I've done that because the American trips are only maybe eight slides or so, and then the leishmania is also like another eight slides. So, just kind of, these are still trypanosomes. They're still trypanosomes. All right, so our American trypanosomes. One that we're going to talk about is Trypanosoma cruzi. All right, this is one that we can we see here in Texas. This parasite was first described by a Brazilian physician by the name of Carlos Chagas in 1909. For that, his disease name has been named after him, Chagas disease. How many of you have heard of Chagas? How many of you, well, I guess if you, if you don't know anyone that has had it, you wouldn't know the name. This parasite is found in South and Central America. It extends into the Rio Grande Valley. Right? It utilizes these rejuvid bugs, these kissing bugs, as they're named. We have them here in Tom Green County. Uh, we picked up these rejuvids uh, down in Val Verde County down at Big Oak River Ranch, and they have had trypanosome, probably trypanosoma cruci in the gut. What did they learn that bug? I've seen that bug in so many places. There's others that look a little bit similar, other comb noses, but yeah, they're, they're out here. They're out here. All right, this parasite infects eight to 11 million humans annually, but, makes it hard to control. It infects 100 to 150 different species of animals. So it's not just humans that it's going to go into. So it's using animals as probably, it's utilizing animals as reservoir hosts that then maintain the parasite so that humans can get it. Now the vector is this kissing bug, the rejuvid, uh, especially the genus Triatoma. Now, in this parasite, it's only found in the gut. So it's not going to go up to the salivary gland, as you'll see with the life cycle. And since it's in the gut, it's going to develop its posterior station development, which means it's going to exhibit this type of stercorarian transmission, or what I'll say is the bite and crap method of transmission. Our bug depicted here, when it bites, will ingest the, the blood and tissue fluid. Its abdomen will expand. And when it expands, it will basically poop itself. Whatever contents are in there will be pushed out. Right? And those contents, they include the infective stage, gives us a way to infect the humans. All right? So what we'll do is we'll start with the American trypanosomes with the life cycle. Life cycle is different. Uh, and we'll probably get into leishmania on Friday as well. So... 
pretty interesting. And I will say that I've modified our life cycle because some new, new information has, has come out in like the last 10 years or so that isn't in the textbooks. So we'll update our life cycles. Don't forget, we had, uh, I did post some quizzes on the acanthocephalins. So uh, I think I put the due date Friday? It's tomorrow. I, would, I don't think I would have done Thursday. Maybe Friday or maybe tonight. Check it out. Start reviewing your acanthocephalins. Um, and I'll probably post the Africa, the intro to protozoan and the African trypanosomes uh, probably tomorrow. I'll get it posted, and then you'll have like end of the day on Monday to kind of take it and, and kind of keep up. All right. I'll see some of you this afternoon. What's that? Friday. Friday? Yeah. Thought so. Yeah.